Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in the feast day of all saints, in the Desert Fathers and throughout many of the fathers, you get a similar theme of one in particular from Abba Longinus of the Desert, where he says, give blood, receive spirit, as the Desert Fathers were wont to be rather terse and to the point because, of course, their life was so stripped down to the minimum, but actually the necessity of things. They took away all the distractions and got to the point very quickly. That's why when we see these supposedly pithy sayings of theirs, there's so much food, so much life in these little things. They didn't waste their time with idle talk about important matters. Give blood, receive spirit seems quite contrary to the rest of the world and what the world teaches us. It's not about comfort. It's not about ease. It's not about getting everything we want to in this life. It's about struggling for the sake of the gospel. It's about denying ourselves and taking up our cross. And that is the way we receive the Holy Spirit. As we've said many times, St. Seraphim of Saroth, yes, we love to talk about him glowing and saying, my joy and Christ is risen and all these things, but we forget about him talking about the flames of hell crackling around him while he was kneeling on a rock for a thousand days and nights. There was much shedding of blood for him to attain to the state of spiritual life that he did. It's very important. In the Troparian for today, depending on the translation, the one that I know, is adorned in the blood of the martyrs throughout all the worlds in purple and fine linen, thy church, who then with cry to thee, O Christ God, send down thy compassions upon thy people, grant mercifully come and wealth and great mercy to our souls, or peace to our commonwealth. Adorned in the blood of the martyrs, that is our purple and fine linen, the struggles through which they went through. Of course, in the early church, this feast was a, saint, a feast of all martyrs. Gradually, it began to encompass other saints as well, those who were unknown to us primarily, because there are so many saints that we will never know because of their hidden way of life, and of course, the thousands upon thousands of martyrs that have shed their blood for Christ. The first line of the Gospel today, He who confesses me, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. He denies me, I will deny before the angels, I will deny before my fathers in heaven. But the English misses something, and the Slavonic misses something as well. If you read what the Greek fathers, John Chrysostom and others say, the Greek actually says, he who confesses in me, I will confess before my fathers in heaven. If you think about the lines of St. Paul over and over and over, who lives in Christ, he talks about being in Christ, living in Christ, doing our work in Christ, in Christ's power with Christ's grace. We don't confess Christ without living in Christ, certainly not before men and for the temptations of this world. But it does not say who denies me, denies in me, because one cannot deny in me. They're not living the way of the gospel. They're not living in Christ. It's an important two-letter word that gets missed. It's also two letters in Greek, but it gets missed. And so it's very important that we live our lives in Christ. And what does Christ promise us? struggle, but we will be hated because of me. He tells Paul, I will show you how many things you must suffer to enter the kingdom of heaven, how many afflictions you must endure. He tells the church over and over that people who kill you will think they do God's service. He tells them that the world will hate you, that people will turn against you, your own families will turn against you. I've come to bring not peace but a sword. And of yours, yes, of course, a godly peace is a good thing, but he did not bring that. He, brought, uh, he did bring a godly peace, forgive me, he brought a godly peace, but he did not bring a worldly peace, which is a spirit of compromise, and a spirit of not wanting the truth, and not wanting things the way they are, just to get along in a spirit of comfort. He came to bring himself, and that sword sometimes divides, as we read in the Gospels' families. He said, not to fear them which were able to kill the body, but fear, fear him who was able to kill the soul and both in the Hades, or both in the Hades. Great difficult words we're receiving here, but this is the way of the martyrs. That is the way we, why we have the martyrs' relics in the altar and on the Antimensium. Why in the early church they served on the graves of the martyrs. Because martyria is the ultimate witness, and that's what the word means to begin with witness. They witnessed fully before Christ with everything in their lives. And then he says to the disciples, 
He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Who that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That does not mean that loving our parents or loving our children or loving others is a bad thing by no means. But we are, in fact, to have preferential love for God above everything, no matter what the cost, even if it is the cost of our family, even if it is the cost of losing children, even if it is the cost of losing people that we love dearly, and homes and lands. We must love God above all else. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things should be added unto you. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is it with God, or is it with the ways of worldly happiness? Those things can come with God, certainly, especially if the family is living in Christ and confessing in Christ. The story I have recounted before will continue to recount, which always moved me. There are many, many stories like this in the lives of the martyrs. But the holy martyr Chrissy, or Zlata in Bulgaria, as she's known, when her she was trying to be, of course, tempted over into Islam, and they tried and they tried, not only through promising her wonderful worldly things, but threatening her with persecution. She continued to abide fast in Christ, and as they butchered her, literally, tortured day after day after day, her parents and her brothers and sisters come to the foot of her where she's being tortured and tell her, just renounce Christ for now. He will forgive you. Now, we've all heard lines like that in our lives. It's okay. It's fine that you didn't come to church. It's fine that you broke the fast. But it's, 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 you're weak. It was okay. God will forgive you. We, we always assume God's forgiveness. We always assume that without living his way. Perhaps we should be stricter with ourselves as the fathers teach, as the saints live. And what was her response to them? Of course, it's a much more dire situation than those I pointed out. But her response was, you are no longer my family. I have the Lord Jesus Christ as my father, the most holy Theotokos as my mother, and the saints are my brothers and sisters. How awe-inspiring this woman was, or young, young woman was. Incredibly awe-inspiring. No one could tempt her away from Christ. No little thing could tempt her away from Christ. No promise could take her away from Christ. Because she knew these promises were full of deception and lies. Of course, in this passage, when we skip later on quite a few chapters, the Lord is asked by Peter, Lord, we have left all things to follow you. What's to know? What, what's, what's for them? Because they had, in fact, given up their lives for Christ and would continue to do so even more in the future, much more. But he says, he who has forgotten or forsaken lands or houses, or fathers or mothers or wives and children or lands for my sake, will by no means lose his reward. He will receive a hundredfold in the kingdom of heaven in the various passages. We have that for us. But we must realize that absolutely nothing, not our job, not our house, not our thoughts, not the way we like to think about things, not our politics, not the way we like to eat, nor our entertainments, nor anything can come between us and the love of Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. He, does, he is a jealous God, as he says. He does call us, as he does in the apocalypse, to return to our first love, to follow him only, to have no idols before him give our lives completely over to Christ, and he will fill us up. And we have as examples all these wonderful witnesses, or martyrs, if you will. We have the holy apostles who left their homes and left their lands and left, left their families and followed Christ for the greater part to the, to the loss of their own lives. And the ones who didn't lose their lives suffered terribly, John being the prime example. After that, we have, of course, all the wonderful martyrs who literally gave everything, their very life, did not fear those who could kill the body, but only loved the soul, and realized that their body would be brought back forth up with Christ in the resurrection. 
There was nothing to fear. And you look at the boldness of the martyrs, it's truly amazing. You go on and on about those stories. I read a few last night that would probably take too much time today. You have, of course, the examples after them of the hierarchs who fought for the faith. And the, and the monastics who went out into the desert or wherever they went to deny day by day with a slow, bloodless martyrdom their life and denying themselves, their own will, an incredible witness to the faith. And throughout the ages we've had countless men and women and children who have given up their lives for the sake of Christ, whether physically but certainly spiritually, always gave it up for Christ. In our own day and age, what can we do? As I said last week, we could say our morning and evening prayers, we could come to church more often, we could keep the basic fasts, we could read the scriptures. It doesn't have to be elaborate. He was faithful in that one little thing, to be faithful in that which is great. We could be the one person at our work who doesn't stand around the proverbial water cooler and gossip who either changes the topic, says something beautiful about the person he's being gossiped about, or walks away. We can be the one person who does not waste our lives talking about worldly things and frivolity. The one person who doesn't waste our lives talking about political elections constantly. The one person who keeps the fast despite the fact that everyone else is not. The one person who at their work doesn't seek to stab everyone else in the back but to help the others. And whatever comes upon them, they take with joy and see those people as their benefactors. To be the one person who isn't always lauding ourselves, but humbles ourselves and only speaks kindly of others. We can be the one person who doesn't always fall into idle talk, but always speaks to the glory of God. We can be the one person who on Saturday nights or before our feasts comes to the services and prepares themselves truly for the reception of the Holy Mysteries, as is the tradition of our church. We could be the person who frequently comes to confession and doesn't pass it off as something minor and sees none of their sins as minor, but as things that separate them from the glory of God. We could be that person who, despite the fact that the world around us is denying Christ right and left, certainly in our own society, who says no and stands up for the witness of Christ, who confesses God in Holy Trinity, who does not deny God by, by saying that other gods are the same as our God, who does not deny God by proclaiming that the God of the Jews and the Muslims is the same as the Holy Trinity because it is not, who does not deny the church by proclaiming that the church exists outside of the church because it does not, who proclaims the Orthodox faith, the faith of our fathers, the faith of the saints, as we are blessed to see right now in our own time, quite a number of hierarchs are standing up for the faith and proclaiming these things, which, because of their witness, I've been trying to preach for years. And it's a joy to see that people are still wanting to witness to the truth and the fullness of Orthodoxy and the fullness <coughs> of the Church. And remember that orthodoxy is not different than Christ. He is the head of the church. Orthodoxy is his body. And we must be witnesses to that fact. The world needs this. The world desperately needs this. Our time of martyrdom is probably not far away. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. But there are all the signs that are in the pre-Soviet era of Russia. All these things are there. The only people that are cast down are the people that proclaim Christ. <coughs> Will we be ready? The only way we can possibly be ready for that is lives of asceticism and just basically living the life of the gospel now. He who confesses in me, I will confess before my Father is in heaven. Take up your cross. Follow him. Follow the witness of the martyrs. And from this day forth, love Christ above all else. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.